Wilfred Griggs, who is uh, Emeritus Professor of Ancient Scripture at BYU, who has had a very distinguished career as a teacher, as a lecturer, and as a researcher. And I can say this, from the experience of my wife and myself, we took uh, classes uh, from uh, Professor uh, Griggs going on 49 years ago uh, as a student just before we got married. And he is going to be speaking on the, the, the Temple of the Sacred in early Christianity. Thanks to, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> sorry. Thanks to Professor Ricks for this invitation, kind of. Uh, You're welcome, kind of. <laughs> and the kind of will become more explicit as I continue on. Uh, can you all hear uh, my, my voice has been somewhat <clears throat> inconsistent recently, so I don't know how it will be. The term soccer and related forms, giving us our English word sacred, means something consecrated to God. And templum, Greek from the Greek temno or temenos, refers to land that is cut off or set aside from common use and dedicated to a deity. Putting it another way, a sacred area or a temple designates restricted space and the activities performed in that ground dedicated to a god or a goddess are likewise limited to those authorized to be there. Virtually all ancient cultures had such sacred sites, such as groves, high places, springs, caves, and so forth. Shrines or temples were often erected on temenoi, the word I used above, or sacred lands, uh, terai sanctai, and the rituals and ceremonies performed in the temples were as restricted or to authorized participants as were the sites. The name given to such sites, or rites rather, was mysteries, a word which means to keep one's mouth shut or to keep the material secret. The ancients were so faithful to the concept of secrecy that we still do not know today details of any of the Greek mystery religions to give one example, and even though we know a lot about Egyptian temples, uh, one can go through one Egyptian temple after another and get the general gist, but exactly what was said and done there is not still perfectly known. So we would say that the initiates were faithful to their oath of secrecy. Now, having said that, it would be strange indeed if Christianity did not have a temple tradition. And a study of available sources shows that such a tradition did in fact exist. In keeping with the already mentioned concepts of restricted space and keeping the mysteries of the temple ceremonies from the general public, we should expect our study then to require meticulous research into all available sources because if the people did in fact honor their oaths of secrecy and sacredness, we would have to dig rather deeply to come up with understanding of that tradition. So let us begin with the New Testament, looking for clues and evidences of a Christian temple tradition. Now, much of what I'm going to say will be elementary to many, maybe to all, 
but it's necessary to cover the ground and lay a foundation. The Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, were missionary texts, each directed to a specific audience. The contents of these writings were intended for public consumption and were clearly meant to be read by as many people as possible. One would not expect, therefore, to find temple mysteries in them, but there might be hints or allusions to such sacred matters. A quick survey will illustrate the point. Matthew was written to Jews, and the major message to his audience is that Jesus was the fulfillment of all of their messianic hopes and expectations. The author makes liberal use of Jewish writings and traditions to illustrate and support his testimony to Jewish readers. Within this public record, however, there are suggestions and allusions to, more, to a more restricted level of worship within Christianity. Contrary to much popular opinion, teaching through parables was not a common Jewish custom. When Jesus was delivering a number of parables relating to the kingdom of the heavens, his disciples came to, a, to him privately and asked, why are you teaching in parables? Jesus answered, because to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of the heavens, but to them it has not been given. And so much for clear understanding, Jesus then went on to interpret many of the parables to his disciples, so they at least would know what he was talking about. One must enter into a covenant with God and receive the Holy Ghost to be initiated into that restricted level of understanding. And as I've mentioned, the disciples struggled with parables, and we can observe even at the Last Supper something that I found both humorous and insightful. After Jesus, as you remember the Last Supper account in the Gospel of John, Jesus had given a rather chilling and threatening description of what would happen in his departure and what would happen to his disciples after he was gone. This was not a nice picture that he was drawing for them. And how did they respond to that? They said, well, at least you're no longer talking in parables. <laughs> so much for the parables then being just a common way of teaching. On one occasion, Jesus was walking with his, disi his disciples in the Galilee, not far from Caesarea of Philip, distinct from Caesarea on the seacoast or Caesarea Maritima. And the famous conversation that we all know took place there. Simon bore his testimony that Jesus is the son of the living, would I dare say, resurrected God. And the reason I say, dare I say, resurrected, I used to attend a, a lot of conferences dealing with uh, the Nag Hammadi Library and some other uh, texts like that. I, I had translated virtually the entirety of the library, and it was fun to go to conferences and share ideas. But... The thing that fascinated me was that in, in a lot of the Gospels and other writings in the Nag Hammadi Library, Jesus is introduced as Ho Jesus Ho's own, which is Greek, but it was used in that fashion in Coptic as well. And it literally says Jesus, the living Jesus. But if you read almost all of the translations of those texts, scholars just simply refer to it as the resurrected Jesus. And I thought that was kind of cute. Um, so one time at a conference, I raised my hand. And, yes, Griggs, what, what, what's on your mind? And I said, well, since you all translate Ho Jesus Ho's own as the resurrected Christ, maybe since... Jesus, or, well, Peter refers to Jesus as the son of the living God, Hotheos Hotzon, and I said, therefore, maybe we ought to refer to God as the resurrected God. Oh, that just did not go down well at all. Uh, and they said, how can you think of such a thing? And I said, I'm just trying to insert consistency. I know how we do this with, with our Coptic text. Why don't we just transfer it over? And they said, not even a Mormon would go that far theologically. <laughs> I let that conversation slide. I didn't pursue it. I thought it was interesting. Jesus renamed Peter. There are things going on here that 
should ring bells, but we'll let them pass. He renamed him Petros, and we could get into that in some detail, but won't. And then predicted that Peter would receive the keys of the kingdom of the heavens, which could open the doors of the spirit world or the gates of the spirit world. And Peter, and obviously the others, would be authorized to perform eternal sealing rites for the saints of God. Now you'll notice I said spirit world, and I know the King James translation uses the word hell, but the word that I have translated here, spirit world, never ever in Greek literature from the time of Homer on down through Greek literature never refers to hell as a place of punishment. It's simply the realm of departed spirits, and there's no sense of it being either this or that. In fact, lots of things could happen in the spirit world and did in the literature. So I hope it doesn't bother anybody that I say spirit world rather than hell. A week later, following that conversation in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus took Peter, Jacob, and John privately up to a secluded area on a high mountain. We're in chapter 17 of Matthew. Jesus was transfigured or glorified before his apostles. And then Jesus was joined, in fact, they were all joined, but Jesus particularly was joined by Moses and Elijah. And those three glorified people, Jesus now being glorified with the other two, they gave the promised keys of the kingdom to the three apostles. And the clarification of that was given by Joseph Smith. And you can find that in teachings, page 158. Even without Joseph's clarification, the context is pretty clear. As soon as the visionary experience was concluded, Peter said to Jesus, it is good that we were here. If you wish, I will build a three-part temple, three tents or tabernacles all kind of put together in a complex, one part to you, one part to Moses, one part to Elijah. And by the way, the words used there are, in fact, the words used for temple in the Old Testament. The wording of the passage, if we read through the whole passage, we won't tonight, but it's really clear when you read through it that there are omissions in the text. It's been edited, and you can just read it and say, hey, something's missing here, and it is, but we'll move on. Enough is present, however, to ensure the establishment of a temple context for this experience. The priesthood keys, therefore, were temple related. As Jesus and the apostles descended from the mountaintop on the following day, we get that from Luke, the Savior commanded the apostles to say nothing about the experience until after Christ was raised from the dead. There is clearly now a connection between the keys of sealing, promised, the temple on the mountain and Peter's desire to build a three-part temple, the spirit world and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they're all brought together and they're all connected, but Matthew doesn't make clear what the relationships are. One can ask, why not? Well, we'll see. Matthew's account of the resurrection of Christ and his subsequent appearance to his disciples gives yet more intimations of the holding back of sacred matters or the mysteries. The major purpose of all New Testament Gospels is to declare the good news, and the good news is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. His resurrection is the bona fides or the assurance of the redeeming suffering and death he went through. Only a sufficient number of his resurrection appearances to establish veracity are included in each gospel. They don't give much. They, they just have very few disciples, as you're all aware. And the authors are strikingly reticent to give a full account of his resurrection ministry. Even the Book of Mormon account of Jesus' appearance among the Nephites, the editor of that account says, quote, there cannot be written in this book even a hundredth part of the things which Jesus did truly teach unto the people. Is that because there were too many or because there was a sacred silence being observed? 
you have to decide. A heavenly messenger instructed the women at the tomb the morning of the resurrection to tell the disciples to travel to the Galilee and Jesus would meet them there. We're back in Matthew. As an aside, I'll just point out to you that the four or five days it would have taken the disciples, their wives, and whoever else was going with them, uh, the four or five days it would have taken them to journey from Jerusalem to the Galilee just coincides, uh, corresponds to the length of the ministry that Jesus spent with the Nephites. Isn't it nice how things just sort of work out? Jesus appeared to the women before they passed the angelic message to the disciples. That is, as they were leaving the tomb, Jesus appeared to the women and he repeated to them the instruction that the disciples would, would see him in the Galilee. Okay, so we're, we're good with Matthew going there. When the eleven apostles arrived in the Galilee, they ascended a mountain according to the instructions given to them by Jesus. He had told them an instruction, either to the women or in some way, to meet him on a mountain. Was this, in fact, the same mountain where three of them had earlier received the temple keys in chapter 17? It's a tantalizing possibility. At this point, the reader is somewhat surprised to read that the entire meeting between Jesus and the apostles reported in Matthew is given in a three-verse commission to preach the gospel to the entire world. As important as that is, was it really necessary for them to go to the Galilee just to receive that three-verse commission? Surely there's more. Why doesn't Matthew give us more than we have? Matthew's reference to meeting on a mountain gives a hint that the temple matters also occurred there since mountains are well-known temple symbols. In keeping with our other earlier observations that temple mysteries are for an, initi for an initiated audience in a restricted or holy setting, we can conclude that Matthew is giving broad hints in his testimony concerning a sacred level of worship, the mysteries of God in Christianity. It is widely acknowledged that the Gospel of Mark is actually Peter's testimony of Jesus Christ dictated to John Mark in Rome not long before the apostles martyred him there. Uh, references, uh, there are many, but I just give you one, Eusebius, book two, for example, Secret Mark. A man named Morton Smith, professor of history at Columbia University, discovered and published in 1973 a short text that he had found in a monastery in Israel, which purports to be written by Clement of Alexandria. We'll meet him again in the second century AD. The text was a copy of a letter written by Clement of Alexandria to some unknown person named Theodore. In the fragmentary text, Clement states that Mark wrote the gospel, the one that we have in our New Testament, as dictated to him by Peter. And then the text goes on to say that using Peter's notes, Mark later wrote, quote, a more spiritual gospel, end quote, for those who were being initiated or perfected. Even so, the text continues, Mark, and now I'm quoting, Mark did not write the things which were not to be divulged, but rather he included all of the things which would, as a mystagogue, the word mystagogue is, is the technical term meaning one who leads somebody into the mysteries. He included the material that, as a mystagogue, guiding one into the mysteries, would lead hearers, again quoting, into the holiest part of the sanctuary or the temple hidden by the veil. Clement adds that the secret gospel was carefully guarded in Alexandria even in his day. So this isn't, this isn't uh, rumor, this isn't just legend, because Clement says he saw the gospel, the secret gospel of Mark. And he says it's protected and guarded in Alexandria, and quote, it is being read only to those who were being initiated into the great mysteries of God, end quote. It should be noted that many scholars do not accept Smith's discovery. 
In fact, now there are many scholars that believe that the whole thing was a forgery concocted by Morton Smith. I, a number of years ago, I'm, I'm stepping aside from the talk because it, it occurred to me that you might be interested to know how these things kind of work out. A number of years ago, I went to a week-long conference on papyrology at Naples, in Naples, Italy, and I had a, a text that I was translating and publishing that I read in the conference, and it just happened that I was reading it in Morton Smith's uh, section. He was the he was in charge of this particular part of the conference, and I was I was reading in his section. He and I had not met before. I'd read some of his stuff. But as I read my, uh, gave my presentation, he was both interested in the text that I was translating, and then he had read some stuff that I had published, and he came to me after the session, and he said, you and I need to become better acquainted. I said, well, okay, we have time, as long as we can get gelato, I don't care. So <laughs> for the next few days, uh, I spent more time, frankly, than I would have preferred with Morton Smith. Very interesting person. I, I, I'll just leave it at that. He's very interesting. But we did talk about the secret gospel of Mark a lot during those days. I mean, we discussed not only the book that he wrote on the subject published by Harvard University Press, but also an article he had just recently published on the same subject in the Harvard Theological Review. And we went through this rather uh, in detail, and he asked me my opinion because I had done some publishing on uh, things Egyptian and Christian. And I can assure you, as much as one can assure somebody that Morton Smith neither would nor could have perpetuated this as a forgery. Uh, it, it wasn't in his makeup. And the text itself, I'm sorry, it, it doesn't, I took a course on how to detect forgeries from, from one of the greatest forgery detectors in scholarship, a man named Daryl Amix. And in, in our seminar, I was the only student, so it was a fun seminar. <laughs> but Amix taught me how to recognize forgeries, art, texts, and that sort of thing. And I, I became confident that I could detect forgeries. And it might surprise you how many forgeries there are in the world. In fact, at the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago, for years they were proud, very proud of their artifacts, which they had in the museum there, only to find out thanks to Amex primarily, but a couple of others too, that they were all forgeries. And so one by one, these things were taken away from the Oriental Institute. It was an embarrassment to them. I mean, what? And the St. Louis Art Museum, they, they, had, they, they wanted to become a real splashy museum, so they went out and bought all kinds of ancient sculptures, Greco-Roman sculptures. And they had this wonderful collection, only again to have Amex and a couple of others show them that they had acquired uh, probably one of the finest collections of forgeries in the country. I mean, so forgeries is, is a game, and there there are forgeries out there. But I, I think people would be hard pressed to, to make the Clement of Alexandria text a forgery. But I know why they do that, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. The first verse of Mark's gospel states that the record is the beginning of the gospel. And the word arche is used there. This is the beginning of the gospel. It says the beginning of Mark. And the word arche can mean either beginning or foundation, introduction. It has a lot of meanings to it. But what really is going on at the, at the outset of Mark's gospel is saying, this is the foundation. The gospel of Mark isn't, it doesn't even intend to be the whole thing. It, it's, it advertises itself as the foundation or the beginning. The implication is that there is much more, and the text we have is just establishing the basic rudiments for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, having said that Mark wrote his gospel as Peter dictated it, we can then say that Peter's enthusiastic and impetuous personality shines through the gospel of Mark. And the text is replete with miracles, deeds, and actions. You think of Peter's personality, and then you read the Gospel of Mark, and you'd say, yes, this is definitely a match. His testimony is of an active Jesus, and there is little reflection on temple-related concepts. 
There is a significant collection, however, of non-canonical Petrine writings which show P Peter in a temple context. But unfortunately, our time doesn't permit us to go into those tonight, so we'll have to defer that to another occasion. We will, however, bring forward the two canonical letters of Peter and see what they have to add to our survey. In the first surviving letter, 1 Peter, Peter writes to the church members in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and they were experiencing severe persecution and suffering. Peter reassures the saints of God's saving power to both the living and the dead, including those who are persecuted or suffering, as they were. Twice in the letter, the apostle writes about Jesus going to the spirit world and preaching his gospel to the spirits of deceased people. Jesus must have given that information to the disciples after the event, in other words, after the resurrection. And it confirms our hypothesis that the post-resurrection ministry of the Lord was temple-related. When we couple these passages with the promise of the bestowal of the sealing keys, extended, which extended to the realm of spirits in Matthew 16, along with the events of the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, all of the pieces, not all, but pieces of a great puzzle begin to come forward. And it's revealing and instructive for us to start connecting the dots and seeing how they fit together, so to speak. In the second of Peter's New Testament letters, the apostle gives directions on apotheosis. That's a term meaning to put on the divine nature of God. The apostle describes these things as, quote, great and precious promises, which he says, quote, pertain to life and godliness. So he's giving us how the, the instructions on how to become gods and goddesses. And in fact, that's precisely the purpose and the function of a temple, to pass from the profane to the sacred, from death to life, I'm quoting from an author, from the ephemeral to eternity and from the human to divine. And that's how Mircea Eliade expresses this idea of temple in his book, Cosmos and History. Peter states that this temple experience is necessary to help one make his or her calling an election made sure. He ties what he is teaching to the mountain of God. We've already come up against that, haven't we? I mean, when you get mountain of God, we know we're talking temple language. And he assures his readers that he's giving them the more sure or certain or dependable or secure prophetic teaching. This is what they need. It should come as no surprise, therefore, as we've looked at just briefly at these letters, it shouldn't be surprising to us that Joseph Smith declared that, quote, Peter penned the most sublime language of any of the apostles. I can understand how Joseph really liked these things because they are speaking to the very things that were being revealed to Joseph Smith. Well, on to Luke. When Luke composed his testimony of Jesus Christ to his dear friend Theophilus and by extension to a broader Gentile audience, he wrote that his account was a personal assurance or guarantee to Theophilus that the other similar declarations or gospels were true. Virtually all commentators and exegetes agree that Luke's gospel is, quote, a sayings gospel. Keep that in mind, if you will, focusing on the sayings and teachings of Jesus. Most also argue that Luke used as a primary source for his writings a mythical source given the title of Q, standing for the German word quelle, or source. I say mythical because so far no identifiable fragment of such a text has ever been discovered or proved to have existed. But never mind, it's, it's accepted by virtually all, most New Testament scholars, not all, but most. But passing over most of Luke's gospel and the hints and clues of temple matters in that composition, let's go on to chapter 24, the Lucan account of the resurrection, since we're homing in on that as a focus tonight. The resurrection appearances of Jesus to various people in chapter 24. There is no other chapter in the New Testament, and in fact, I would say, or anywhere else in the Bible, 
that is so tightly constructed in its chronology as chapter 24. The emphasis placed on the sequential timing of the events in this chapter draws attention to that fact. There are three scenes in chapter 24, each referenced to the day of the resurrection. The first scene, and by the way, as you well know, uh, chapter and verse divisions in the Bible don't always, in fact, often do not correspond to the reading of the text. I, I, I'm sure Professor Ricks and I could do a much better job dividing dividing the Bible into chapters and verses. We wouldn't split stories in half. I mean, it's so awful to have somebody say, I'm reading a chapter a day, and you think, I hope you just don't begin at verse 1, because if you do, you're missing part of the story, as everybody here already knows. But the first scene takes place at the tomb very early on Sunday morning. And those involved on that scene were the, dis the female disciples of Jesus, two heavenly messengers, and lastly, Peter. We'll skip now to the second scene. The second scene takes place on the road between Jerusalem and Emmaus, a small village about seven and a half, seven and a half miles northwest of Jerusalem. Luke states that the encounter between the two disciples and Jesus took place that same day. You see here, Luke isn't giving us any chance to sort of say, well, this happened a few days later or sometime later. He says, that same day in verse 13. And all three walked in leisurely fashion to the village, conversing along the way. When they arrived at Emmaus, Jesus stayed long enough to have a meal with them, after which he suddenly disappeared. Scene 3 begins in verse 33. Continuing with the, with the precise reference to timing, Luke, state, Luke states that after Jesus left the two disciples, quote, they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem. Again, there's just no wiggle room. We have the scene at the tomb in the morning. We have a scene a little later in the day on the road to a mess. And then later in that day at eventide, as our lovely hymn states, we, we're going to get to the third scene. And it says, they rose up the same hour, those two disciples, and returned to Jerusalem. One assumes that the return journey to Jerusalem probably was made at a faster pace than the earlier journey to Emmaus. They were in a hurry. And seven and a half miles, it didn't take that long to get there. They found the 11 apostles and those who were with them without any apparent difficulty. They seemed to know where to go to find them. And as they reported their earlier meeting with Jesus earlier that day, the Lord appeared to all of those who were present in verse 30, verses 34 and 36. A ritual recognition scene follows. We won't, we won't take time to get into that. Uh, I'll leave that to Professor Ricks to talk about. After which Jesus ate some food as proof of his physical reality. After a discussion or lecture, then Jesus led the group over the Mount of Olives to Bethany. I don't know how many of you have been in the Holy Land, uh, but walking from Jerusalem over the Mount of Olives to Bethany is about a, if you're not in a great hurry, it's a comfortable 40, 45 minute walk. It's not that, not that hard. Once they got to Bethany, Jesus gave blessings to them and then ascended to heaven. According to this gospel account, then, the resurrection ministry, as reported in Luke, lasted no more than one day. And the precise references to times during that day do not allow for any extension of the resurrection ministry. Imagine, therefore, if you will, the surprise that Theophilus must have experienced when sometime later a courier arrived at his door, knocked, and said, I have another book from your friend Luke. And he gave him part two, or the book of Acts. So Theophilus, obviously, I can't you just, what surprise and wonder and joy he must have felt when he received part two 
And whether he went back and read the last part of the gospel so they could get a running jump at the second part, I don't know. But, but in any case, let's begin the book of Acts with him. Immediately following the opening address, Theophilus read in this sort of casual narrative way that Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection and was with them for 40 days. <laughs> Don't you think now at this point Theophilus would have gone back to read the last part of the gospel? How did that work? One day at the gospel and suddenly just Oh, he was with them for 40 days. And not only that, and it says, quote, he was teaching them matters pertaining to the kingdom of God. Such a casual statement at the beginning of Acts, followed the, following the precision of the one-day account at the end of the gospel, leaps out at any reader. All of you undoubtedly have experienced what I've just talked about. Luke is clearly sending a message that he does not intend to give details about the events of the 40 days. He just is going to let him know that there were 40 days. Beyond that, nothing. And isn't that an odd thing for the, for the author of the sayings gospel? Luke is known for being the sayings gospel writer. I mean, whatever Jesus said, that's what Luke's going to report. And yet, no. But there's more. As Jesus discoursed to the disciples on the Emmaus Road, Luke states that, quote, beginning at Moses and all of the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures, in all of the scriptures, the things that pertain to himself. Silence. Not one word of what the resurrected God taught. I don't know about you, but I'm frustrated at that point. I want Luke to tell me something other than the fact that Jesus did a lot of talking. Likewise, when Jesus gave a similar discourse to the apostles later that day on the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, as they all related to him, quote, he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Again, not one word of what the resurrected Christ said is divulged by Luke. Add to these passages the silence regarding the content of what Jesus said and did during the 40-day resurrection ministry, and even a dull reader can discern that Luke is observing a sacred silence on that period of time. The natural conclusion, therefore, is to classify the words and events of the resurrection ministry as part of the mysteries of the kingdom relating to the temple keys discussed in Matthew. What other conclusion is there for us? We've been led down the path. We've been given all the clues. We are logical. We understand. We can read. It's very clear. Well, from Luke, let's go to Paul. Paul mentions to the Corinthian saints that he and his fellow disciples, his fellow apostles and other church leaders, are ministers of Christ and Paul says, and we are stewards of the mysteries of God. In that wording, one understands that there is a sacred responsibility to safeguard the temple-related teachings and rituals. No explanation is given for this verse, and scholars do not read the passage as I have just read and interpreted it. As we progress further in our topic, my reading will become clearer and I hope more acceptable. The Corinthian church was the most unruly and fractious of all of the churches addressed in the Pauline letters. And the saints were given much corrective counsel and direction by the apostle. By the way, he, he had visited Corinth earlier on a missionary journey, and he wasn't an apostle then. He went back to Jerusalem by uh, commandment, as it were. He was called back to Jerusalem, and it's pretty clear he was ordained an apostle then. And, and the Corinthians only knew him as the missionary Paul. And now he's coming back as the apostle Paul. They weren't quite sure what to do with that new authority. Anyway, they, they, the saints in Corinth seem to have turned away from faith in the, or belief in the ministry and resurrection of Christ. And Paul devotes an entire chapter to the subject of the resurrection. Most scholars mistakenly believe that 1 Corinthians is the earliest written account of the resurrection of Christ. But the date is less important than the content. While the Gospels portray limited appearances to a relatively few 
bunch of believers, Paul expands the picture. He says that Jesus appeared to more than 500 people at a time. And he says to his audience, the Corinthians, he says, and more, of, more than half of them are still alive. The implication is, if you don't believe me, write to them. They know, they saw him. 500 at one time? When, when you read the Gospels, you'd be hard-pressed to come up with anything even closely related to that. This large figure indirectly supports the idea that they also receive teachings and instructions, these more than 500, none of which is mentioned in the texts. The appearance of the resurrected Christ to more than 500 people should give pause to biblical scholars and theologians who think and publish that the Gospels give relatively complete accounts of Jesus' visit to a few select disciples. Uh, I, I find that fascinating disconnect. One evidence for Christ overcoming death and sin for all people through his own death and resurrection is the practice of being baptized on behalf of deceased and unbaptized people. That famous passage, everybody here knows it in 1 Corinthians 15, 29, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise, if the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized? You know, everybody knows that. The implicit argument behind that practice, baptism for the dead, is that it would be meaningless were it not for the redemption available to all people, both living and dead, through the suffering, death, and resurrection of Christ. This unique New Testament passage again brings to the reader information and rituals which fit only the post-resurrection ministry. It dovetails nicely with Peter's statements about Jesus preaching to the spirits of deceased people in the spirit world and also uh, the other passages that we talked about. But most modern commentators do not make the kind of connection we're making. I will give one example. It's one of my favorites. In their classic volume on the life and epistles of St. Paul, Coney Barrenhausen and their book not only was in print, but it's being reprinted. Probably many of you have copies of it. But when they talk about 1 Corinthians 15, 29, they say, quote, the only meaning which the Greek seems to admit here is a reference to the practice of submitting to baptism instead of some person who had died unbaptized. Okay. Yet, say these two commentators, this explanation is liable to very great difficulties. One, how strange that St. Paul should refer to such a superstition without rebuking it. Perhaps, however, he may have censured it in an earlier letter and now only refers to it as an argumentum ad hominem. It has indeed been alleged that the present mention of this practice implies a censure, but this is far from evident. I, these, these men are struggling with the text and at least they're being honest with it, if not insightful. And then they say part two, and this is nice, if such a practice did exist in the apostolic church, how can we account for its being discontinued in the period which followed? I like that. I mean, that's the kind of honest scholarship that doesn't always appear in the literature. It's honest. They admit, we don't know. Yet the practice, they continue, the practice was never adopted except by some obscure sects of Gnostics who seem to have founded their custom in this very passage. I, I'm going to interrupt their comment to say that's not true. I have plenty of evidence in my own library of much more baptism for the dead activity than that, and not by some obscure sects of Gnostics, but oh well, whatever. On the whole, therefore, concluding their comment, on the whole, therefore, this passage must be considered to admit of no satisfactory explanation. Again, that's honest. One can extract a significant observation from this note. When there is no understanding or acceptance of temple teachings and practices, anything related to the temple appears to be nonsense, pagan, or even blasphemous. Paul is concerned that if the Corinthians cannot accept the resurrection of Christ, they will deprive themselves of all that the resurrection represents and promises, including the blessings of temple rituals and covenants for both the living and the dead. Paul makes sense. 
if you have the right background. Well, moving away from Paul uh, to the Corinthians, let's go to another of Paul's writings. In Paul's essay to the Hebrews, uh, that, that work is essentially an apologia or apology, but the word means defense. It's a, it's a defense of the superiority of the Christian temple over the Jewish temple. That's not, by the way, a common way of reading the essay, but I don't care. The Jewish temple was presided over by high priests ordained by men to the lesser Aaronic priesthood, and though they continually offered sacrifices at the altar, they could not offer redemption, and they could not lead people into the presence of God or through the veil, as you all know. Uh, see especially chapters 5 and 8 through 9 for uh, what's in the writing. By contrast, the Christian temple is presided over by Jesus Christ, ordained by God to the greater Melchizedek priesthood. Here we're in chapters 5 and 7. And Paul goes on, saying he offered himself, Christ offered himself as one eternal redeeming sacrifice, and through his offering, he made possible access through the veil to God. And interestingly, in chapter 10, Paul says that Jesus himself is the veil. We pass through him into the presence of the Father. That makes sense to everybody here, even if it doesn't make sense to anybody writing on Hebrews. So Paul says that we can go in and here he says into the holiest place, that's in Greek. Uh, Hebrew doesn't have for adjectival forms, it doesn't have comparative and superlative. If you want to say a superlative, you have to put two words together like Lord of Lords, King of Kings and so forth. And so they, for them, they would say holy of holies, whereas the Greek would just say holiest place. Well, it's, it's the same. So Paul says in this essay that cr through Christ we can go into, if you want to say holy of holies or the holiest place, into the sanctuary, into the presence of God. Christianity, therefore, is not a repudiation of the Jewish temple, but it is rather an elevation of the temple to match the new covenant and testament of God established through Jesus. This like I said, this is all elementary to all of you. And if anybody's gone to sleep, just sleep on. It's okay. <laughs> because, but, but I felt it was necessary to say, look, it is there. It's not a secret. Well, it is in a way. But not to those who know. Let's move on to John, the writings. John's various writings also provide temple-related hints and clues. In the letter we call 1 John, the apostle and seer is writing to the saints near the close of that gospel dispensation. In fact, the last writing we have in the New Testament chronologically is 3 John. And the, I don't know how many of you have ever participated in what, in my youth we called them, what did we call them? Uh, like road shows. People would go up on the stage and and there was a person designated to pull the curtain and he was to listen carefully at the last line of whatever was being put on and then he would pull the ropes and the curtains would, well, third John is the curtain puller. The scene is closed. The dispensation is over with by the time third John is finished. But in the first John, in the first letter that we call first John, John writes of the saints having fellowship with the Father the Son, and with each other. That word, fellowship, is a technical term. And it is, it's a term that establishes shared identity and relationship through a ritual activity. I mean, this is not just New Testament. This is Greek literature and Greek terminology. Paul taught that Christians gain fellowship or identity with Jesus Christ by taking him into themselves through the bread and wine of the sacrament. I have some references here. Uh, if you want them, we can give them. John implies the same shared relationship with the Father and the Son gained through temple rituals, and that's what happens. We become as they are. In fact, John says, when we see Christ, we will be like him. Um, the clearest indication of this shared identity is in chapter 2, verse 27, where the apostle reminds his readers of the anointing which they have received. 
The anointing represents the complete temple ceremony and its instructions. The, uh, John says, quote, the same anointing teaches you concerning all things. That's about as good a temple definition as one could ask for, isn't it? Key words or phrases, then as now, are sufficient to stand for the whole. Today, all one has to do is say, I received my endowment. Well, people who know, know what that means. It stands for the whole of it. When John writes and says, you received your anointing and it teaches you all things, they knew what he was talking about. And he reminds them, and there are other parts in the letter that say the same thing. The revelation given to John is so obviously a temple document that little needs to be added here. The deliverer of the vision to John was dressed in high priestly clothing, and the Father and the Son actually become the temple in the New Jerusalem, precluding the need of a structure. I mean, the, the purpose of the temple is to go into the presence of God. But if you're going into the city and the Father and the Son are there, you don't need another building. They are there and you're with them. And that's what goes on in, chapter, in the book of Revelation in the New Testament. Pardon me. Temple symbols and images are scattered throughout the apocalypse. The temple is as central to Christianity as it was to Judaism. We've just been dealing with hints and clues. And, but, but surely, surely, they are clear enough for us to draw the obvious conclusions. Well, we've now come to the end of the time allotted to me. But you can see I've just begun laying a foundation for a proper study of the, temp of the temple and the sacred in early Christianity. We must therefore retitle my presentation at this point. We will call it now a prolegomenon or a proemion to an examination of the subject. Borrowing an analogy often used by Jesus during his ministry, that of a feast or banquet, I can state that to this point we have only set the table. Though we have experienced some aromas and scents of the dishes being prepared for our consumption, since we've all just eaten, I hope that doesn't make anybody too hungry. We can tell from the place settings, the utensils, goblets, cups, and everything on this beautiful table that we are indeed in for a great feast. But moving forward with our study of the temple in Christian history will require a multi-meeting course, perhaps modeled on the pattern of a graduate student seminar. Now, because I don't have the venue or the resources to conduct such a course with you, let me recommend now that each person conduct an hypothetical seminar. Do your own. And I will outline how you might proceed. First, I will note that each person has a menu and recipes. We know what we want, and we would know how to make it. But the problem is, where are we going to get the ingredients? Where can we find how the stuff we need to make our meal? Well, there are three sources, and I will give a brief description of each and then turn us all loose to go after them. But before that, I need to make one observation. Everyone will have observed that in my brief survey of New Testament writings, I omitted the fourth gospel. Had I included the Gospel of John, there would have been no time for anything else. It will take at least two sessions of our hypothetical seminar to place the Gospel of John in its proper temple context. When I realized that some number of years ago, it came to me rather, not just suddenly, it, 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 it was more than that. I'm sorry to take more time, but I'll tell you how it happened, kind of. I was preparing for fall lectures. I had some courses to teach, as professors do. And one of the courses I was teaching had to do with uh, classical antiquity, beginning with, well, a little earlier than that, Near Eastern and then classical antiquity. But I was just reading through some classical texts. I was reading some Greek plays. Um, and they're fun to read in Greek. They're just delightful. And as I was reading through a number of these plays, I got to about the 1st of August, and I suddenly remembered that I was going to teach some New Testament courses. And I thought, I better cut this off, and I better prepare for my New Testament classes. 
So I put my classical text aside and I pulled out my New Testament and I thought, well, I'll start with John. I'm familiar with John. I'll go there. I've been writing a commentary on John for many years. Still haven't finished it. But I turned to John and, and suddenly I realized I was reading the same thing I'd been reading already. And I thought, this can't be. I must have gone brain dead or something. So I read some more in John. I made some notes. And then I went back and got out some books that I have on, on the origins of Greek drama and the rules that are followed. And of course, all of that began in the temple. As you know, all of our arts all began in a temple context. Drama, art, music, uh, poetry, all of that, that. They all had temple origins. Everybody knows that. But as I read those books about the origins and the development of drama in antiquity, and then I came back to John, I thought, my goodness, how have I missed this all of these years? And so as I then went through the Gospel of John, I started all over. I, I'd made two or three abortive attempts to write a commentary. In fact, one day, Hugh Nibley and I were walking across campus together. I don't know why and where we were going. That doesn't matter. But we were just talking, uh, kind of like on the road to Emmaus sort of thing, I guess. But I asked him how he was doing with his work on the hypocephalus, facsimile number two. He'd been working on that for, oh, I don't know, 10 years or something at that point. And he told me, and, we, and I was looking, I told him I was looking forward to more work. Then he very kindly said, by the way, he says, you've been working on John about as long as I've been working on that. How's your John stuff coming? And I said, well, no better than yours. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not there yet. And he's, I said, because I've run into some issues with John, some things that I hadn't expected to find, and I've run into some challenges, things that I'm not sure about. I've had, as I put it to him, I've had strange ideas about John. And he said, oh, oh tell me. So I told him some of my strange ideas. And he listened and listened. And finally, when I quit, he said, well, those are strange ideas, Griggs. But he said, they're not nearly as strange as the ideas I've had about John. Well, I couldn't stop at that. So I said, OK, tell me some of yours. He did. And I admitted to him, your ideas are stranger than mine. And I said, why don't you then write a commentary on John? Yeah. He said, now, Wilfred, you know why I can't do that. So we walked in silence for a little bit because I was trying to think what I knew <laughs> that would prevent him from writing a commentary on John. And I couldn't come up with anything. And I said, all right, Hugh, I give up. Why can't you write a commentary on John? And he said, because, Wilfred, I would have an 800-page commentary. And then I could go on to verse 2. <laughs> well, I am not nibbly. So I do not have 800 pages on verse 1. So far, I'm only up to about five or 600 pages, and I've decided I'll let the other two pages go with Nibley. That's fine. But that's, that's what's going on. The Gospel of John is so temple. Like I said, it would take two sessions of our hypothetical seminar for us to place John in its proper temple context. But now the three sources that I promised for you. First, Jewish materials. They will be helpful, even if at first they might not seem to appear to be relevant for a study of the temple and Christianity. Uh, that's misleading as a thought. After the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70, the priests, the Sadducees, and the Levites were unemployed. <laughs> they were just out of business. And frankly, they basically disappear from Jewish history. They're gone because the temple was what made them what they were. The rabbis who had no love for the temple and they were not anxious for its return became the defining power of Judaism. Producing at Jamnia at about the end of the first century, a canon of scripture based on Torah and prophetic tradition and the synagogue as the replacement of the temple. And of course, the rabbis were in charge of the synagogue, so that established them. 
But despite their being reluctant witnesses for temple matters because of their general antagonism to the temple itself, the rabbis couldn't entirely ignore the centuries when the temples provided the physical and spiritual central feature of Judaism. Rabbinical literature from Jamnia through the Mishnah and then on through the Talmuds and on down even into the Middle Ages provides a rich, if somewhat reluctant, source for information relating to temple teachings and covenants. So, number one, and by the way, the Jewish, the Jewish sources have been, were swamped in Jewish sources. I mean, everybody knows the Dead Sea Scrolls, of course, and that's nice, but they pale in comparison to other discoveries of Jewish sources. For example, the Cairo Genitza. Genitza is the kind of a closet behind where they kept the Ark of the Covenant. When the Jews didn't want to use the text anymore, they threw it in the Genitza. And this Genitza in Cairo has so far provided more than 300,000 texts. That's a lot. And there's a lot of stuff in the Cairo Genitza that still is to be published and translated. I worked on some of it for a while and I was fascinated. It's, it's there, it's interesting. So the Jewish sources are more than just in passing. All right, the second source. The patristic tradition in Christianity similarly provides indirect and illuminating information relating to temple matters in the ancient church. From the apostolic era, and by the way, we have a lot of writings both traditionally and recently discovered writings uh, going back to the apostles. Through the so-called apostolic fathers, on to the apologists, the heresiologists, the theologians, ecclesiastical leaders, and other notable authors, we encounter increasingly disparaging and hostile attitudes regarding temple doctrines and practices, although attempts were made off and on to alter the meanings of such things and sneak them into Christian theology and the liturgy of the church. It's amazing how much temple stuff has made its way kind of in the back door into Christianity. So it's, you can find it, you just have to look for it. One of my favorites, and I want to share one with you, I, 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 this is fun. A ninth century author named Photius. Photius was the ninth century patriarch, one of the ones in the ninth century, patriarch of Constantinople. As you know, Catholics and Copts have popes. The Eastern Orthodoxies have patriarchs, so he's a patriarch. He compiled for a friend a review of 279 Christian literary works. That's the first book review publication that I know of in antiquity. There may be others, but this is a formal review of 279 different books. In this collection called the Bibliotheca, one of the reviewed works was written by our friend that we met earlier, a second century Egyptian Christian priest and teacher, Clement of Alexandria. I, I like Clement of Alexandria very much. Uh, I've liked him for a long time. I, I like what we have of his and I like what I read about him from other people. Citing a work known to Phocius but lost to us, this patriarch and theologian declares that mostly Clement is orthodox and acceptable in his writings, mostly. But, says Phocius, sometimes Clement veers off into heresy and false teachings. As examples of these false teachings and heresies, Phocius states that Clement taught that God created innumerable worlds and that matter is eternal and can neither be created nor destroyed, although some matter is organized and the rest is not organized or chaotic. Clement also taught that Adam and Eve were glorified and exalted beings who voluntarily set aside their divine status temporarily to come to the earth and become the first parents of the human race. Are you at all interested in Clement? <laughs> well, too bad. Because just when matters are getting interesting, Phocius shuts it all down. 
saying that Clement becomes too blasphemous, too impious, and just downright disgusting. He will not continue. One could wish that Phocius had gone on, or better yet, that we had the lost work of Clement. But isn't it nice that despite himself, Phocius provides evidence of temple concepts in his diatribe against that second century thing? One just has to ask, the world just isn't fair, is it? Uh, Many other church fathers provide similar, if reluctant or unwilling, sources of the sacred and temple traditions in earlier times. Now the third source I've saved because it's the best of all. During the past two centuries, tens of thousands of ancient texts have been recovered. When I say tens, I could say hundreds, but I don't want to become boastful here. So let's say tens of thousands of ancient texts have been recovered, hundreds of which are explicitly Jewish and Christian and are also explicitly temple texts, both by designation and in their content. They are increasingly available in translations for those unfamiliar with the original languages. And as the Lord instructed in Doctrine and Covenants section 91, verses 5 and 6 regarding such materials, quote, whoever is enlightened by the Spirit shall obtain benefit therefrom. So we are not discouraged from reading. To the contrary, we are encouraged to get the Spirit of the Lord and then go for it with gusto and enthusiasm, like Peter's personality. In the hypothetical seminars that I have proposed for us all, we who sign up have menus and recipes for the banquet. The ingredients are available, as I've described to you, generally. And we would be able to create an ancient Christian temple banquet. All we need is to go find the ingredients and prepare the feast. Now, if one complains that the search for the ingredients is difficult and challenging, let us recall what Jesus taught concerning the valuable pearl. One has to search diligently to find it. One should not expect to wake up some fine morning and open the front door and see a bag of pearls sitting on the porch. Likely, that won't happen. So, let our individual seminars begin. I assure you from my personal experience that the search for ingredients is both worth the effort and highly rewarding. May the Lord help each of us to prepare a temple banquet and feast truly fit for the potential gods and goddesses that we all are. Thank you. A few minutes uh, to make some modest reflections on it, his paper, after which uh, John Thompson is going to be uh, reflecting on uh, his paper. And after that, I hope we can allow for the opportunity for a few questions uh, before we uh, will want to um, be on our way home in anticipation of uh, the beginning of the session tomorrow morning. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Professor Griggs did not, uh, uh, did mention uh, uh, that he and Kent Brown wrote an article about the 40-day ministry that appeared in the August 1975 issue of, of the Ensign with some very interesting uh, insights uh, about the 40-day ministry from the apocryphal uh, gospel accounts. Uh, John Gee, who is uh, here uh, this evening, wrote in the Encyclopedia of Mormonism about the 40-day ministry a, a few things that are uh, quite useful. He says, the, uh, these 40-day ministry accounts report the following. 
Jesus teaches the apostles the gospel they should preach to the world. He tells of a pre-mortal life and the creation of the world, and in the world that life is a probationary state of choosing between good and evil, and those who choose good might return to the glory of God. He foretells events of the last days, including the return of Elijah. He also tells uh, the disciples that the primitive church will be perverted after one generation and teaches them to prepare for tribulation. These apocryphal accounts state that Jesus' resurrection gives his followers hope for their own resurrection in glory. Besides, salvation for uh, the living, salvation for the dead is a major theme, as are the ordinances, uh, baptism, the sacrament or Eucharist, ordination or the apostle, of the apostles to authority, they're being blessed one by one, and an initiation or endowment um, with an emphasis on garments, marriage, and prayer circles. These accounts, usually called secrets, are often connected somehow to the temple uh, and are said to ascend, uh, um, are compared or compared to the Mount of Transfiguration that we'll be speaking about uh, momentarily. Sometimes the apostles are said to, to ascend to heaven when they see these marvelous things. That is uh, the heavenly ascent. Whether everything in such accounts is true or not, the actions of the apostles after the post-resurrection visits of Jesus contrast sharply with those before. Let me give you just one example uh, of one of the uh, accounts that we find in the apocryphal Acts of John at verse 94, as we read. Before he was arrested, even before his uh, trial, crucifixion, and resurrection, uh, he introduced uh, these to the uh, disciples. Before he was arrested by the lawless Jews, whose lawgiver is the lawless serpent, he assembled us all and said, Before I'm delivered to them, let us sing a hymn to the Father, and so go to meet what lies before us. So he told them to, uh, told us to form a circle, holding one another's hands, and himself stood in the middle and said, answer amen to me, uh, after which he begins to sing and uh, to say to them, after which they um, uh, repeated uh, the amen. Further, uh, allow me to uh, note this with regard to the Mount of Transfiguration experience. I think of uh, <clears throat> observations made by Joseph Smith and uh, Heber C. Kimball about these. Joseph Smith said uh, that on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John were sealed up to eternal life by revelation and the spirit of prophecy through the power of the holy priesthood. And Heber C. Kimball observed, uh, Jesus took Peter, James, and John into a high mountain, <coughs> excuse me, and there gave them their endowment. For the same purpose has the Lord called us up into these high mountains that we may become endowed with power from on high in the church and kingdom of God and become kings and priests unto God, which we never can be lawfully until we are ordained and sealed to that power. For the kingdom of God is a kingdom of kings and priests and will rise in mighty power in the last days. And allow me to add one other thing. This has to do with the notion of baptism for the dead, uh, the po uh, possibilities for interpretation are very considerable. And yet the phrase baptizumenoi, uh, uh, Hupertone necron in the genitive only has 
uh, a couple of uh, possible renderings. Let, let me get uh, this. Uh, Liddell and Scott, uh, there is no uh, intention on their part to come up with something that would represent special pleading on matters relating uh, to this particular issue. It notes that with the genitive, uh, one of the meanings is spatial, uh, re uh, meaning uh, it, that could have the meaning baptism over uh, an individual. Uh, one particular Italian author writing ab about this notion that one finds in 1 Corinthians 15, 29, talks about uh, certain traditions of having baptisms for uh, individuals who had died previously, that is baptisms over uh, the, the dead person. There was somebody who was living beneath who was able to provide a proper response. Uh, the other meaning uh, with the genitive has the sense of uh, in defense of or in behalf of and it goes on. Uh, one of the other meanings is because of, by reason of, for the purpose of, for the sake of. So many of uh, the meanings that are associated with baptism for the dead with uh, the preposition in the genitive case have connections with baptism on behalf of uh, the uh, dead. Uh, John. So Stephen and I, I think, um, <clears throat> started off differently. Um, I believe he started off preparing some questions, um, and I started off preparing like a formal response. Um, and then as we kind of talked a little bit more, uh, right at the last minute, he prepared a formal response, and I have prepared questions. Uh, <laughs> so. So I do have a few questions, and I uh, hope Dr. Goods is okay with this. Um, but some reflections on his, on his comments uh, with some questions that hopefully that he can uh, to give us some thoughts about. Um, so four years ago, some of you probably remember this, um, Tom Wayment spoke at this gathering and gave as his thesis this. He said, Christianity was in its first 200 years uh, topophobic, right? A term meaning a fear of like certain space, right? that it did not desire a temple, nor did it develop a strong sense of sacred space akin to older Jewish models of sacred space. So that was his thesis. And then he went on to argue that there is nothing, he says, in the early sources indicating the early Christian community's desire to build a temple. Rather, we see them making their homes sacred spaces. They use the temple as a metaphor right, for the collective body, the community, right, the, 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 the Pauline concept, right, that, that the community is the temple. Um, in some, he advocated strongly for a replacement theology, that the Christian community itself is the temple, re, is the temple replacing, right, the physical temple with a form that's more inward. So Amos' views are not new. Um, they are similar to many Protestant interpretations of scripture, but I did want Dr. Grids uh, maybe to uh, comment on this kind of argument, right? That the early Christians didn't seem to have uh, any kind of uh, uh, desire to build a temple. Is that? Sure. Yeah, sorry. We thought you were gonna do it all sitting oh, there. Oh, really? All right. Yeah. Yeah. The questions that are raised are tremendously interesting, uh, obviously to you and to me as well. But in order to give an answer, I need to, you can tell from some of the things that I said tonight that I'm not particularly hidebound to traditional scholarship. In my training at two really quite passable universities, Stanford and Berkeley, um, I was taught 
time and time again by my teachers and professors not to worry about the orthodox interpretation of texts. I mean, these were not Christian texts. They were just things that we were studying in the past. But I was told there would be two bases on which my grades would be determined. One was, could I handle original sources adequately? And two, could I exercise independent thinking? And maybe I've taken that too far, but I just had fun. Because when I would go into seminars, having read all of the literature on a particular topic that I was assigned and was ready to deliver my seminar report, there were a few occasions when I disagreed with my professors who had worldwide reputations and who went one direction, and here I am, a, a student going in to take on the world, as it were, uh, and disagree with them. Fascinating thing happened. Not once, not once did I ever catch any difficulty from the professors. They said to me, we don't agree with you, but you have demonstrated that you can handle texts and that you can think logically. We, we think that you might reconsider some things in the future, but that was never a problem. So having said that, now let me tell you why I'm, I'm without fear. And at my age, what are you afraid of, right? <laughs> uh, but being independent is sort of a privilege, I guess, of age and training. In the question that you raised, the comments by Professor Wayman were Christianity this and Christianity that. Well, you know, that in itself is kind of a problem. What is Christian and what is not Christian? In 1939, a German scholar by the name of Walter Bauer wrote a book, Recht Glaubigkeit und Ketzerei in Oldest Christianity, something anyway, Orthodoxy and Heresy in Earliest Christianity. That book was influential enough that even national seminars of biblical scholars were held as late as the 1990s. I don't know since then whether they continue to do it or not, but they're still debating Bauer. What did Bauer say that caused such a, a furor, if you will? Bauer said, in essence, and he, a very, very fine scholar, but he went back and reviewed all of the sources, and he said his hypothesis is that what became Christian orthodoxy and has remained Christian orthodoxy down to the present time, and that orthodoxy didn't really come into existence until... Well, it began to show up in the late second century and continued on and became ossified by people like Augustine, Jerome, and others. Pardon me. So Bauer's hypothesis or thesis is that what became Christian orthodoxy at the very beginning was considered Christian heresy. And what was at the beginning called Christian heresy became later on Christian orthodoxy. In other words, they just sort of switch places. Well, as I said, that, that thesis of Bowers has been debated by biblical scholars for, well, at least 80 years with no, with no agreement in sight. That is, it's not going to happen. But, but in a way, you have to ask yourself, well, how do you define what is Christian? at the beginning. I mean, to say that the Christians were not interested in building a temple, you can't make a blanket statement like that, because I can show plenty of writings that claim to be Christian, in fact, in which temple was central. Now, I do have two texts that I translated many years ago in which Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, said to the apostles, I'm going to give you the mysteries and he did, to husbands and wives collected together and everything, you know, all of the dressing, the, the prayer circle, I mean, all of that. We have that over and over and over again in documents, and that's what we would do in our hypothetical seminar, is go through some of these things. But, but then Peter, obviously Peter, asked the question, shall we, 
remember, Peter wanted to build the temple on the Mount of Transfiguration. And so he brings up the question again, shall we build a temple? And the Lord said, no. There will not be time to build a temple. The dispensation will not last long enough for you to construct and use the thing. So he gave them alternative possibilities for carrying out temple activities. So in the first place, the building of a temple, right. Uh, there was never any desire to build it, but it was by commandment. Peter was ready to build. <laughs> of course he was, that's Peter. But the Savior in these two documents that I translated years and years ago, Jesus, the resurrected Christ, said, no, we will not build a temple because there will not be time. But now, what about those documents? Well, almost all scholars will say they are not Christian. They are part of the great heresies that existed. I was accused in some of my publications of being a Bowerist, which I laughed at because I'm no Bowerist. I don't agree with Walter Bauer. I do not believe that there was originally an orthodoxy and a heresy that later switched positions. That's, that doesn't correspond to what I have seen in my study of the sources. What I have seen in my study of early Christianity is just a bunch of people calling themselves Christians. And there wasn't the kind of, there wasn't the kind of central authority or communication to bring them all together in unity. So there are different, there are different kinds of Christians. And who's to say which are right and which are wrong? Now, look, this is no surprise to you. This happened already in the time of Paul the Apostle. Paul is fighting against it, and Peter and Jude. They're all fighting against people that are going off and creating their own brands of Christianity. So we can't get caught in a trap of thinking that somehow what today scholars define as Christianity can be seen as an unbroken line back to the beginning. I, I contest that. The evidence does not support that idea at all. So what happens now? We have these documents in which temple kinds of things are being pushed by lots and lots of people calling themselves Christians but the heresiologists, whom I mentioned a little earlier, I mean, people like Irenaeus, Hippolytus, Epiphanius, others, they said, no, these are not Christians. Never have been and never will be. But who's to say? What made Irenaeus the arbiter of who's Christian and who's not Christian? Who made Epiphanius in his Panarion the arbiter of what's Christian and what's not Christian in the earliest time? The church fathers are not an unbiased crew of evaluators. They're pushing for their idea of Christianity. I mean, just so you'll understand, the Book of Enoch, for example, you all know the Book of Enoch, an apocryphal text, right? Not included in the Old Testament. The rabbis hated it, even though the Book of Enoch has been found in the Dead Sea Scrolls as part of a scriptural tradition of the Qumran people. What do you do with that? Well, anyway, by the time you get down to Jerome, Hillary, and Augustine, they hated the Book of Enoch so much that they were able to get an imperial decree passed that anybody found even having a copy of the Book of Enoch would be put to death. Now, that's what you call... I don't know what you'd call it. I guess you'd call it censorship with a vengeance. But that's what they tried to do with everything that they didn't believe in. So if you have a lot of temple texts, and they are, a, there are a lot of temple texts, you're going to find that the church fathers, this, this bunch that developed into the orthodox strain of Christianity, you'll find that they're all against that kind of stuff. And what happens is that there's a catchword. It's a really interesting catchword that collects all of this stuff, like garbage is collected and thrown into a great big pile. Maybe that's a bad comparison. But the catchword is Gnostic. I love that word. It's such an interesting word. The word Gnostic means one who knows. There have been three conferences held in the last 130 years. 
three conferences. I have attended two of them. The first was before my time, and you might say, was there anything before your time? <laughs> But these three conferences held by scholars have tried to define Gnosticism. And it's, it's a fun experience because it doesn't work. Gnostic is just a bad term. Well, one thing everybody agrees on is we don't like them. <laughs> and you might say, well, can you give us a modern example of that? And yes, I can. How many times have you heard people say that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is simply a cult? Right? Well, and if you didn't know any better, if English wasn't your first language, you'd go get your big Oxford English Dictionary, the multi-volume OED, and pull it out and look up cult, and you'd read down through the definitions and say, I don't mind being called a cultist. Because the definitions in the OED are really not that bad. But, but that doesn't matter. People don't ask you to define it. They ask you to feel about it. And so when they say Mormons are cultists, what they're doing is appealing to your emotions, not your intellect, not your brain. And everybody hates cultists, so there. We're wiped out just like that. And Gnostics the same way. One of the most famous Gnostics, to give you an example, is a man by the name of... Sorry, I just went brain dead. Um, Valentinus. Valentinus was a good Christian. Everybody admits that. Even Epiphanius, uh, not Epiphanius, even Irenaeus says, yeah, he was a good Christian. And, and, Epi and Valentinus did something very, well, it wasn't very strange. Everybody was doing it. He went off to Rome to run for bishop. This was at a time when running for bishop was like running for political office, and that's what Origen said happened to the church. Origen's very good about this. Origen said, the temple fled to heaven. We don't have that anymore. We wish we did, but Origen admits if we had the temple, we wouldn't know what to do with it. Isn't that honest? Origen, by the way, is probably the greatest Christian theologian that ever lived. We have ancient sources that say he wrote and published 6,000 books. Do you think he'd make rank advancement? <laughs> 6,000 books. Fortunately, we don't have them all. Well, I shouldn't say that. But Origen has a lot of interesting ideas in his writings. He said, we wish we had the temple, but we wouldn't know what to do with it. It has fled to heaven, he says. And the priesthood of God, says Origen, has fled to heaven. And he said, the only thing that's left is for men to run for office in the church that remains on the earth. What an interesting description. So back to the point, who's going to define what Christianity is? Who had the authority to do that? Well, you know the answer. The apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ had that authority. Paul could write and say, you're out of line. Peter could write and say, you're dry wells. Jude would say even worse things. I mean, they all knew, but they, as apostles of the Lord, could define what is Christianity. And I do not believe that there are very many modern scholars. I like these people. They're, they're friends of mine. I, we rub elbows. I've gone to conferences, read papers, listened to theirs. They're fine people. I, I don't mean anything personal against them at all. But I will raise the fundamental question, who are they? to define what Christianity is or isn't. And so for somebody to say to me, well, the Christians didn't want to build a temple, I say, well, it depends on who the Christians are. Who is in the position of arbitrating who really is a Christian? The apostles, once they're gone, all bets are off. Now it's just opinion. I know a lot of people think the Apostolic Fathers are just wonderful. I, I don't have such a high regard for the Apostolic Fathers. In my opinion, they're just a bunch of ambitious, self-serving people trying to save their own skins ecclesiastically and sometimes otherwise, although there are a couple of them like Polycarp that wanted to die, and I think that's a little morbid. But anyway, you see, the problem is here. It's, it's, a, it's a problem. Who's going to define who the Christians are that do or don't want to build a temple? Well, if you're just going to write them all off and say they're all Gnostics, I'm going to say, well, that's okay. You can do that if you want. But I don't buy that. 
I have a lot of writings that are said to be Gnostic writings that I think could very well be put in the scriptures. A lot of my friends would consider me worse than heretical if they heard me say that. But, but again, I follow a definition of Christianity given by Joseph Smith, the prophet. I'm going to recommend a book to you. It's a little off subject, but that's okay. In 1962, a very fine scholar, a physicist, finishing his PhD at Harvard in theoretical physics, somehow went just slightly off course and decided to become something else. And he became a very, very fine historian of science. His name is Thomas Kuhn, K-U-H-N. He wrote a book that has influenced not just sciences, it, he wrote it mostly, he wrote it entirely for the natural sciences, but, but a lot of other disciplines, sociology, psychology, and others have picked up on his book and tried to use it, I don't think very successfully. But, but in any case, Thomas Kuhn makes this point. He says, once you establish what he calls a paradigm, it's a framework, a structural framework within which scientists work with axioms, theorems, hypotheses, methods, and they do problem solving. And as long as the paradigm works, they stay with it. But as Thomas Kuhn points out, and it has happened in virtually every natural science, there comes a point when some scientist, usually not one of the established bunch, when some scientist comes along with revolutionary thinking, revolutionary ideas, and comes up with a whole new perspective on things, and suddenly Kuhn says that there is a shift in the paradigm, sometimes even a replacement of the paradigm with a whole new paradigm. I would ask my friend, Professor Kent Crookston, to help me with this for a second. As far as I can think of, that has happened in every branch of natural science that I'm aware of. It happened in physics, geology, Chemistry. Medicine. Where? Medicine. Medicine, uh, which is part of biology in a way. But I mean, there, in every, every discipline, there has been some, some great discovery, some thing that just redid the entire paradigm of that discipline. I'm just trying to look up the title of this book. What is it? The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. It was published in 62, and then a second edition came out in 1970. But it, it's, it should be required reading for just about anybody that wants to know how, how things develop. But what I'm going to suggest to you, and the reason I'm saying, look, we are not here practicing science tonight. Professor Crookston would let me feel the imprint of a shoe on my back if I did that, because I'm not. But the thing that's really fascinating to me about Kuhn's book, and you read it and then see if what you think, you see, Christian theology was established slowly, the gathered steam, and then became Christian theology what it is. And by the way, the main figure in all of that is Augustine. Everybody knows that. But what was Augustine's philosophy? Well, he was a Neoplatonist. His philosophy was Neoplatonism, and we have of Augustine's writings. We know that he translated... Neoplatonic writings into Latin so that he could deal with them better. He, his Greek wasn't really all that good. So Christian theology is essentially Neoplatonic philosophy for almost a thousand years. But thanks to the Arabs, we don't often want to thank the Arabs, but they, they deserve a lot of our gratitude because at about 1000 AD, the Arabs who had established universities and medical schools and all kinds of really interesting activities in the East went conquering and a conquering that I mean look everybody knows this is some heck of a story they went down they conquered like wildfire they went across North Africa they got up into Spain and they landed there and we call them the Moors right well they established their learning schools there and people from up in Northern Europe France, Germany, and elsewhere, they would sneak off. It would be, if they were caught doing it, they'd be killed because it was considered death dealing to deal with the infidel, the, the Moors. But they would sneak on down to 
places like Alhambra and other Toledo, they would go down to the south and they'd sneak in and hear lectures and they learned from the Arabs. And the Arabs brought back, by the way, Hebrew. <laughs> they probably wish they could retract that part of their history because our Hebrew Bible, the MT as it's called, thanks to the, we have that thanks to the Arabs. But the other thing they brought was Aristotle. Aristotle had been lost as a philosopher. We had some of Plato, not a lot, some, but they brought Aristotle. And Aristotle took that part of the world by storm, and particularly Thomas Aquinas. So Thomas Aquinas recast Christian theology from Neoplatonism into an Aristotelian mode. And so Catholic theology is more Aristotelian now and not so much Neopythagorean as it was from Augustine down to, say, Aquinas. Is this just too terribly boring? I mean, I find this fascinating. <laughs> you might not, but to me this is interesting because, again, it goes back to the issue of what is a Christian? Is it a Neoplatonic Christian, a la Augustine? Is it an Aristotelian Christian, a la Aquinas? What is it? And who is going to decide? Well, now back to Kuhn. In 1820, there was a paradigm shift of major proportions. The Lord appeared to Joseph Smith, and the two things that had been booted out of early Christianity by the church fathers that didn't like them, Revelation and the temple, became the keystones of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. And so now me, I'm saying, well, now I've got a, now a good, working, prophetic, God-inspired definition of what Christianity really is. Can I go back and find it? And that's what I spent a lot of my career doing, is going back and just reading everything I could get my hands on. And if I couldn't read something, I learned the language so I could read it. It's delightful fun to pick up a Slavonic grammar and learn how to read some of that. I'm not particularly good at it, but I can read Slavonic texts. And same with Ethiopic. I decided I wanted to read the Book of Enoch and its Ethiopic version. It's just more fun to go and do it that way. But I found out, in my, as I said, my research has led me to an absolutely wonderful wealth of treasures. So I guess my response is, I'm not going to try and define Christianity for anybody else. I will let the Lord and Joseph Smith define it for me. And then I will go back using that model, that paradigm, to use Kuhn's language. I'm going to take that paradigm revealed by God to the prophets in our time. I'm going to go back and see what I can find of that paradigm in the past. And it's just been fun. Now, maybe you don't think that's fun, but to me, that is so much more fun than anything else I can imagine doing. But ah, there. Now, you asked another question. You asked about Christians building the temple, and why didn't the church want to build a temple? Well, I, I, I hope I've given no, some. I think I've tried to give some sort of an answer. And you see, the problem is when you get a professorial type, we only learn how to speak in 50 minute sentences. <laughs> <laughs> So you probably would be well advised not to ask too many more questions. Yeah. <laughs> Matter of fact, I'm going to forego all the rest of my questions. <laughs> but I just want to respond to your reply because I think that was uh, masterfully done. Um, as a really, I had also thought about that moment when they came off the Mount of Transfiguration and wanted to build temples. And to me, that's a perfect example of Christian desire, right, to build temples. And I love how you frame that as an answer. I think that was really good. And then to consider also in the book of Acts, right, that, that um, after Jesus is gone, if you look carefully, they're constantly, I mean, they were always at the temple when Jesus was here, but even after he's gone, constantly in the temple, right? That's where they're teaching. That's where they're healing. And, and, and then we're, we learn that a great company of priests, right, join the church, it's the temple-centric people who were, were um, you know, uh, drawn to Christianity. And, um, and so, uh, anyway, so thank you for that. And I will turn the time back over to Stephen. In the interest of time, and uh, so that we can get enough sleep that we uh, will uh, be able to get to...
the beginning of a, uh, the conference at 8 o'clock tomorrow. We'll take one question, one half of one question. Anyway. <laughs> Nobody wants to. Okay, nobody. Another 50 minutes is too much. I have a reach. Okay. Short answer. Did you have a reference to what James was saying? He would he was a representative bail. Can you repeat that for the audience? Sorry, okay. the what? When Jesus was the, becomes the veil. Becomes the veil. Yeah. That's Hebrews 10, 19. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Yeah, 19 and 20. I mean, and it's clear. I mean, it just says he's the veil. And then we go through him mm -hmm. to get mm -hmm. This is so straightforward, isn't it? The internet can't hear you. Though. Okay. Mm -hmm. repeat the question, Robert. Uh, the question was raised about where Jesus is identified as the veil, and the answer was given by uh, people in the group, Hebrews 10, 19, and 20. But again, it's so clear that in that writing, Paul is not just defending the temple, He's elevating it. You just can't read chapters 9 and 10, for example, in Hebrews without coming away knowing that Paul is pro-temple. Now, of course, I, I'm aware that most people don't think Paul wrote Hebrews. I can't help them on that. But um, regardless, it's very, very clear that the author of Hebrews, as far as I'm concerned, Paul, is very pro-temple, but with, with the changes from Aaronic to Melchizedek, changes from this side of the veil and sacrifices being offered constantly to the one eternal sacrifice and now, finally, entrance through the veil. I mean, I don't, that's the only way you can really read that writing. So, yeah, I, this is... Well, I've had a good time. Thank you. And thanks to Professor Ricks for uh, not, not for having me give this talk. I'm sorry for that. I didn't mean to put you through that. But for the last seven months or however long it's been, I have been reading and reading and reading again and again things that I have read, things that I had never read before. And I have just had one fun time. And I hope you have as much fun as I have had. Thank you. I uh, will plan to, to see you tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock when the conference begins.